I'll be talking today is the experience uh, that FAO has gained in Niger, uh, where uh, warehouse receipts financing or warrantage, as it's called there, has become very, very popular. Uh, Niger is, a, is one of the poorest countries in the world. It's, it belongs officially to the LDC list of the United Nations. Uh, it exports mainly agricultural products and uranium. Uh, it has basically three export partners. Uh, the majority of their exports go to Ni Nigeria. And the, bis the agribusiness development environment in, in Niger is, is, does not conduce, is not very conducive. I mean, you've got very limited communication infrastructure and you've got an um, in agricultural input uh, market that is very um, volatile and it has a lot of negative interventions from uh, the government um, uh, that has uh, policies that really disrupt the supply of agricultural inputs and then affect a lot the, the, the output of agriculture. So in this very difficult context, is it, it's uh, surprising for some that uh, Warren Touch has become a very uh, popular uh, financial product in the marketplace. They've adapted it to the local conditions. Basically, in, in Niger, there aren't uh, big facilities of storage, and there isn't specialized storage manager, managers. Uh, so it is farmers through their producers organizations that have really organized themselves to build storage facilities. Uh, the producers organization bulk the, uh, the cereal products, mainly uh, sorghum and millet, and they uh, negotiate uh, with uh, local financial institutions grouped uh, credit for their farmers members um, using uh, the, the stock as collateral. Uh, so uh, this basically means that uh, once the local financial institution provides a credit to the producer organization, the organization disperses it to the individual farmer based on the amount that was stocked during that season. Then after four months, which is the traditional uh, uh, maturity period for the credit, uh, each farmer repays the organization and the organization pays back the local financial institution. The, currently, the interest rate is of 2.5% per month. Uh, the amount is usually 70 to 80% of the value of the stock product at the time of the contract. Uh, in terms of the number of clients and beneficiaries, uh, estimates are that uh, there are around uh, over 100,000 clients, which probably means that uh, over a million of people, uh, families of these clients are benefiting. And the penetration rate in rural areas has increased steadily. Uh, currently, estimates say it's around 5 to 6 percent. So how how in this environment has warrantage uh, flourished in a way? And uh, I will try to answer this question uh, based on the, the field observations that we did and the local uh, research made. Here uh, I, I talk about the, the pricing and this relates to, to the question done previously. If you look at the, I would like you to right now focus on the, on the price curve at the top, which is a theoretical price curve that the farmers use based only on the agricultural cycle. That it means holding all import and export markets constant and it's just influenced by the supply, the local supply. At the peak, every, every August, it is expected that that's the peak of the high price. That's when uh, all harvest has been uh, finished, all storage has been depleted, and it's the least avail it's where the product is least available in the marketplace. Then it starts going down uh, during the year as those very few farmers that have access to irrigation starts uh, introducing their harvest into the market. And when it comes to around October, uh, the rain-fed harvest starts reaching the, the, the markets and that's where you get the lowest peak. Uh, around November of the price, and then it starts going back again as uh, storage depletes. That is the curve that actually guides the decisions made by, by farmers. Now, if you look at the real prices, which are then uh, influenced by mainly uh, the availability of agricultural inputs, which is volatile, uh, weather conditions, which are also volatile, some people say it's 
agricultural, the, the availability of agricultural inputs are as volatile as weather in Niger. You never know how much uh, you're going to get. And uh, the demand, the local demand and the export demand for the cereals, which mainly come from Nigeria, those are the ones that disrupt that theoretical uh, price movement and, you, and what, that's the result that you get here. But the point that I want to make is that the pipe, the, the high and the low peaks of the price are very predictable. Um, you always get the high peaks around August and you get the low peaks around November. And that really drives the uh, farmers, traders, and lenders to try and organize themselves to take advantage of those price differential. And because it's predictable, they're able to pursue it every year. The second question, uh, the second aspect that I think is extremely important to explain uh, the question is that there is an extremely strong and stable demand for cereals coming from Nigeria. Uh, the Nigerian economy has been uh, growing very fast. It's a net importer of cereals. The purchasing power has been increasing. And so they're able to absorb pretty much any surplus that Niger is able to produce. The challenge for Niger is to produce a surplus, actually. It's not really the, to find the market outlet, which is not the case in many of these, uh, these developed countries. The third uh, dimension it relates to producers' organizations. You see, the, the great business opportunity uh, faced every year has really mobilized farmers to organize themselves and uh, you know, find the governance structures and the organizational mechanisms to take advantage of those price differentials. So uh, they have built storage facilities and they have found ways to make joint loan requests, approaching local financial institutions, negotiating with them, and that has created a relationship, a commercial relationship with them uh, that has benefited both because the lenders have also learned a lot about agricultural finance uh, markets. Um, and the fourth one is, well, related to the MFIs themselves. Um, they have targeted the, the rural areas and the agricultural sector, which has forced them to learn their dynamics. And they, they've been able to uh, really understand the value of these cereal stocks, given the uh, great demand for them. And that's why they accept them as collateral, because they know that in case of default, they'll be able to liquidate them. And uh, the constraint of uh, contract informant fra framework in, in Niger um, is able to be overcome because the financial analysis made by lender is based on character and is based on their prediction about future cash flows that can be generated with the stock. It's not about um, whether, you know, if they go to port, they're going to be able to get the, the, the stored commodity uh, as collateral or not, because that could take ages. And in that picture, you see that the type of infrastructure that these farmers use is, is relatively simple. It's safe, but it's simple. And in the door, you got two locks. One lock, uh, the key for that lock is held by the producer organization um, uh, uh, pledging the, the, the stock. And the other key is, is taken by the financial institution, which is not, not guaranteed. It's just mainly symbolic, but it, it shows you the level of, 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 of trust that exists. This is based, of, based on trust. Um, and. Uh, so I think those are the things that explain the widespread application of warrantage in Niger. Uh, you got the stable uh, agribusiness opportunities, you got the uh, strong producers' organizations, and you got lenders actually uh, being knowledgeable about agricultural markets. But what does that translate in terms of benefits for agricultural households? Well, when you ask them uh, what they use the loans for, they use it exclusively, almost exclusively for trading activities, livestock, fisheries, household goods, uh, small rural co uh, commercial enterprises, or uh, very marginally for those that uh, have access to enough water for vegetable production, which have shorter cycles. Um, and uh, so those income generated activities they, 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 they finance it with the loans, but they very rarely use the warrantage loans for uh, the purchase of agricultural inputs for the main staples because they have a different cycle. They have a longer cycle, uh, longer than the maturity of the loan, so they can't really use it for that. So what's the true benefit of, of the loan? 
The fact that they are able to access a loan to finance short-term activities means that they are able to generate cash while they wait for the cereal to gain price. You see, the poorer the household is, the less able they are to wait until the price gets better. So through the use of these loans, they are able to finance alternative activities um, and that generate cash and allows them to wait for that price differential. And in fact, the main objective of, of all of these farmers is to repay the loan using the cash flow generated from the short-term income generating activities, not the sale of the cereal that is stocked. Um, and just to give you an idea of uh, the price differentials and, and, and how they, are they able to cover the costs of, of the loans, there was this, um, study uh, survey done uh, in Niger very recently looking at uh, about nine years with a sample of 34 producers organizations. Uh, they reported that the price differential that they saw in each agricultural season was superior to the cost of the principal, the interest rate and the fees uh, of the loans they required in 71% of the cases. So because they they, cannot predict, they can predict the timing of the peak, they cannot predict the magnitude of the peak, that's a little bit of a gamble. But uh, in most of the cases, uh, this differential is even higher than that. What I'm trying to say is that th that shows the potential value of the collateral. That, that is a good figure to say we can accept cereals as collateral because in the worst case scenario, we can, we can sell it and, and still make a profit. But again, uh, I emphasize the stocked commodity is not used to repay the loan that was given by the local financial institution. Um, so what does this mean for, uh, for us, you know, the international development agency donors and governments that are trying to um, promote development? First, you realize that you put the constraints and the requirements for Warrantash to works on their perspective in this case because in a, in a country where you have very weak frameworks, you've got a very uh, uh, bad uh, agribusiness development environment, uh, still it works because first, you got uh, stable agribusiness opportunities, and I think this is the core uh, condition, which then leads to uh, farmers really strengthening their organization and putting efforts to strengthen their organizations, and then you get lenders accepting the collateral. Uh, and that's, that's really why it has been widespread. But if you look at the core business condition, uh, that is not easy to replicate you know, when it comes to us uh, developing agencies. You, you cannot create a Nigeria next to uh, every single least developed country that you're trying to help. So when you're trying to promote Warantash, you really need to consider that it can really be only applicable if you have steady, stable, agribusiness opportunities with commodities that are storable. Um, and, you know, uh, once this is met, then you can think of several interventions to support the process, which has been the case in Niger. You can help producers, organizations in improving their marginal capacities. Um, you can help them uh, gain better, higher profits by, uh, you know, participating in higher rent markets. You can help l lending institutions improve their analysis of agricultural markets. Um, but uh, these initiatives are all ultimately led by the local farmers, the local traders, and the local lenders, and you just play a facilitating role. 